Well, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you find yourself. My name is Matt Nash. I'm the Managing Director for Social Innovation at Duke's Innovation and Entrepreneurship Initiative. I'm also an adjunct professor of the practice at Duke's Sanford School of Public Policy. Uh, so excited to be with you here, here this evening. We've got a great and inspiring panel discussion lined up for you this evening on navigating the uneven path to social entrepreneurship. We've got some amazing social entrepreneurs here to talk about uh, talk about their experiences. But before we do that, let me first tell you a little bit about why we're here. So this panel is part of a larger event happening all week, which is the Duke UNICEF Virtual Forum on Social Innovation. Tonight's event is our seventh event this week, celebrating the Duke UNICEF Innovation Accelerator, which is a pioneering partnership between Duke, UNICEF, and UNICEF USA to identify and support social entrepreneurs scaling solutions to the most pressing problems facing children globally. You'll get to hear from one of our accelerator innovators on tonight's panel. But before we uh, have our, our panelists come up, I'd like to introduce you tonight to our moderator, an amazing serial social entrepreneur herself, Madeline Shaw. Now, Madeline has been a great friend of ours at the Duke UNICEF Innovation Accelerator. She actually helped provide expertise to our first cohort of innovators, which was focused on menstrual health and hygiene in a variety of ways. She's a, a multiple award-winning social entrepreneur with more than 25 years of experience launching both for-profit and non-profit social ventures with a social change agenda at their heart. At age 25, she founded Isle, previously called Lunapads, which is a privately held business whose groundbreaking sustainable menstrual care products are sold in more than 40 countries worldwide. Shaw went on to establish United Girls of the World Society, a charity, and G-Day, a national rite of passage celebration series for adolescent girls in 2014. In 2017, she launched Nestworks, a family-friendly co-working community that's reimagining the work-life balance. Uh, not only that, Madeline joins us today as a newly minted author. So I highly recommended her exciting new book, The Greater Good, Social Entrepreneurship for Everyday People, who want to change the world. We're such big fans of this book and, and of Madeline's that we're actually going to provide all of our innovators with a copy uh, of this book uh, from both of the cohorts in our accelerator. So with that, I want to thank you for being with us tonight, Madeline, for gathering such an impressive group of social entrepreneurs to share their uh, journey with us. And with that, Madeline, it's, the floor is yours. Take it away. Wow, Matt. Well, thank you so kindly for that wonderful introduction. And it's just great to be here with all of you again and your amazing team and Taylor and Madison. And just, um, I just am such a huge fan of everything that you all do. And very proud to be bringing um, some colleagues with me today to share their stories um, about being social entrepreneurs. So, uh, without further ado, for folks um, that are new to me, my name is Madeline. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm based on the unceded uh, traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations here, um, also known as Vancouver, Canada. So um, as Matt said, I've been a social entrepreneur for a really, really long time. I love it. And um, I finally kind of transitioned from my role as an entrepreneur to writing about entrepreneurship. And it's just been a huge, huge joy of mine. So. I, I guess the main thing that people need to know about me or, you know, aside from all the ventures and all that stuff is that I love growing things. Uh, they could be plants, of course, and I'm a pretty serious gardener, um, but relationships, organizations, ideas, movements, anything just, um, yeah, I just love it. And I have a um, very big fan of kind of alternative somatic intuitive ways of doing that. Um, so I love the topic of the uneven path to social entrepreneurship. It's a very kind way of framing it, Taylor, that I think you came up with um, for something that can be incredibly, I mean, heartrending sometimes. It's uh, saying to one of the panelists earlier, it can be, you know, just running a regular for-profit, you know, venture that isn't necessarily trying to achieve impact goals is a really, really hard thing to do unto itself, trying to do it while bringing, you know, ethical business practices or, you know, ensuring that you meet the needs of uh, diverse populations is taking something difficult and turning it up several notches. So I, yeah, and it's also personal. And that's what I, I really want to explore today is, is, you know, yes, we've had successes and yes, we've, we've done some really inspiring things, but um, it is an uneven path and one that can be pretty challenging from time to time. 
So um, let's get down to hearing from the panelists and about what this actually looks like and how I'm going to do this uh, for efficiency sake is I'm going to go, we have two Kai's today, so I'm going to go in alphabetical order by last name. And so what that's going to look like, um, well, we'll get to it. Anyways, I'm going to start with telling you about my friend, Alana Ben-Ari, um, who's featured in the book. And um, Alana and I met as part of the CEO Network, which is a really remarkable Canadian um, institution that celebrates and funds uh, women and female and non-binary binary identified entrepreneurs um, in several countries now. Alana is a multiple award-winning design entrepreneur, TEDx speaker, and Inc. Magazine Top 100 Female Founder of 2020. My friend, um, she's been working at the intersection of design and social innovation for over a decade. And her first uh, invention called the Empathy Toy was praised by Time Magazine as being a technology that is reshaping the future. Her company, 21 Toys, has brought the transformational power of play into the thousands of boardrooms and classrooms worldwide to unlock skills like empathy and failure. Um, next up will be Kai Frazier. Um, our first Kai uh, is someone I also know through the CEO network. And Kai is an educator turned ed tech entrepreneur who's passionate about using technology to provide opportunities for underestimated communities. And I love that term underestimated. I believe it was coined by inclusive venture capitalist uh, Arlen Hamilton, but maybe Kai, maybe you made it up, but I, either way, I love it. It's a brilliant turn of phrase. Um, as opposed to marginalized or whatever, underestimated. Um, she's the founder and CEO of Kai XR, which provides interactive 360 degree and VR virtual field trips where children can explore the world from their living rooms. Before creating Kai XR, she worked with several museums, including the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, spe specializing in digital strategy and content creation. Uh, next panelist um, who is very experienced with the Duke community here is Samir Lakani, and uh, he is the founder and executive director of EcoSoaps Bank. He's a social entrepreneur dedicated to restoring health and dignity in developing countries. Samir is the recipient of so many awards. I'm blown away, including a CNN Heroes, Forbes 30 Under 30, Unilever Young Entrepreneurs, and Rotary Presidential Peace Building Award, among others. I loved, I watched a TED talk yesterday called How Soap Recycling Can Prevent Diseases and Create Jobs, which I highly recommend. Last but not least, um, also joining me um, from the unceded Coast Salish territories here in Vancouver is Kai Scott, um, who is also featured in The Greater Good. Um, Kai is a trans man and a senior social scientist educated in the field of international development. He has 15 years of experience undertaking multi-stakeholder processes related to complex social issues. He uses a blend of systems thinking and reflective approaches to solve problems related to gender diversity, yielding innovative and practical solutions. Welcome, amazing, amazing panelists. All right, here are the questions um, that I have for you. Today, so one of the things I talk about a lot in the book is identity. So speaking personally, um, I didn't seek to become an entrepreneur. That wasn't just something that was in my career plan. I saw myself as an artist. I saw myself as a social change leader. And in fact, the idea of becoming an entrepreneur was kind of at odds with my feminist values. I sort of saw them as being a bit um, antithetical to one another. Uh, and yet bit by bit by bit, I came around to see myself and entrepreneurship differently. So I'm wondering what this journey from being, for example, a social scientist or a historian or a student um, to social entrepreneur was like for each of you. How does your personal experience or history lend itself to where and who you are today? Do you want to start us off, Ilana? Sure. And I just want to say I'm so delighted to be here and a huge fan of yours, Madeline. So uh, excited to to be on the panel with all of you. Um, I like to describe myself as a recovering A student. Uh, so I grew up uh, in <clears throat> Winnipeg, Manitoba, which I'm very proud of. Uh, but when uh, my parents moved to Canada and we ended up in Winnipeg uh, at the age of six, uh, that started my quest to 
figure out how to get out of Winnipeg. <laughs> um, and um, my dream school was a design program in Ottawa, Ontario. And so I worked really, really hard. School was my way out. School was my my like ticket to, to kind of a different future. And so I worked really, really hard to get a full scholarship uh, into my dream school. So that worked. Uh, fast forward to after school, but I'll tell you kind of my uh, purpose that began uh, in university. Uh, I, after graduating from university um, and really putting so much work into being a very good student, uh, I discovered that being really good at school has very little to do with being good at life uh, or even work for that matter. Uh, so with a combination of uh, rage and also <laughs> uh, determination to change the way that we, what skills that we value and what skills that we teach um, in schools that kind of led me down that, that path. So I um, very quickly, my dream school industrial design program is called product design. So it's part engineering, part design. So I like to say that it has the workload of an engineering program, but the arbitrary marks of an arts program. So it, it just, it's designed to break you as a human and then rebuild you. Um, and in the process of that program, I was being told how important creativity was, but it was not being valued in the same way. And just how did we mark things? And anyway, there was a lot of uh, hypocrisy from what was being taught to the practice of it. And um, all that culminated in my thesis year where I was given uh, my major thesis project to design a navigational aid for the visually impaired community. And that led me down the path to inventing a toy that is now known as the empathy toy um, that is was meant and designed for visually impaired students to play with their sighted classmates. Uh, but when I would test it during the day at school, uh, or sorry, in, in classrooms with like four and five-year-olds at night, I would test it with the adults in my program. And that's when I realized the toy was just as challenging and just as rewarding, um, no matter your age or, or ability. And uh, the toy kind of lived beyond school. So after I graduated, uh, I just kept gnawing at this idea that I, I think toys could change education. And I think I could be that, that person. Uh, but I didn't, much like you set out to be an entrepreneur. I was a designer who was committed to making my inventions um, real to, to, to put them into, into the world uh, and, and creating a business uh, ended up being my, my, fu my full conclusion. <laughs> that was the only way I could do that. That is so cool. I totally, I so relate to that of like the entrepreneur by necessity, um, but not by design um, sort of thing. Like you're just doing yeah. it to make this thing possible. And yeah. I like, I like to joke, it was a series of escalating dares that just got way yeah. out of hand. <laughs> That is so cool. Actually, I watched a video of you telling that story with at the Toronto, let's call it screw up night. Um, oh. <laughs> it's a great video. Anybody's uh, out on YouTube. Um, anyways, thank you so much for that, Alana. That's amazing. Um, so Kai, I'm going to move along to Kai F. Um, let's hear from you. What was it like to sort of, you know, who you were before and who you became as a social entrepreneur? Oh boy. So I probably have a polar opposite story. Um, I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted nothing to do with it. I didn't even know what it was. Um, and when I was in school, I was homeless. Um, I had, a, I grew up in poverty and I really struggled. Um, and my motto was C's get degrees. So I had to figure it out that as long as I could get a C, I'd get the same diploma as everybody else, but I never really had any aspirations for college or I didn't even know what college, I had never seen a college. Um, these are all really new concepts to me. Um, never really left my neighborhood. Um, so I graduated high school. Um, right before I did, I had a teacher tell me about college. Um, she told me about waivers that I could get to apply to school for free. Um, I was able to get a waiver and um, ask for rides to go visit some schools and made it happen. I, I got to college and realized I needed more money. Um, so college, so the C's get degrees, kept going into college. Um, um, but I did realize a couple of things in my education. One, you know, it wasn't that I wasn't smart. It was that I had to focus on survival. Um, and when you're focused on survival, you know, getting good grades um, are not the first thing you're thinking about. Um, so when I look back, I realized that I learned to be really efficient. Um, so I think about, um, I went on to be, become a teacher and I always laugh at my students who know they can get a 90 instead of a 100. 
and get some time back to themselves, still have a good GPA and, and keep it moving. And I'm like, that that's that's the entrepreneur. Now I see what it is. So from so I was that kid, I could figure out how to get it done. Um, so I could put my time into solving some really impossible problems that I was facing as a child. Um, so I went on to teach. Um, I worked with kids who were just like me. A lot of kids in uh, Title I schools never left their neighborhoods. And um, one of the schools I taught in was in Northern Virginia. I grew up in the, and I was in the DC area. Um, so Northern Virginia is about 20 minutes where I was from Washington, DC. Washington, DC is all the big fancy museums. Everybody travels across the world to see, and they're free. They are free federal museums. So my school, couldn't go even though we were 20 minutes away because we couldn't afford the buses to get there. We couldn't afford the school lunches. So we never got to see anything. So I was really hell bent on how do I get my students to see these life changing stories that are here every day. I figured out that I was gonna go from teaching kids to working in the museums and I was gonna be the one to figure out how to make it happen. Got to museums and realized the museum educators, most of them had never stepped foot in the classroom didn't know anything about what was happening in school. So it was a bigger problem than that. So I, I, I really relate to um, the escalating dares. Mine was asking way too many what if questions and being really stubborn. Like, I think there's a better way. And a little before I knew it, I was starting a company, didn't know I was starting a company. Um, but just to speak to this panel, even though I started a company to try to bridge that gap, it ended up being VR. How could I film the VR, bring it back to kids, be mobile first? Um, the, that was the great idea, but everybody in DC thought I was crazy. I don't have a tech background. I don't have any money. I, I'm a hist I'm like the furthest thing away from tech. I'm a history teacher. Um, and to do it all, I had to really bet on myself. So I went to Silicon Valley for one time, chaperoning some kids on a field trip. Um, that was my first time I saw people talking about big ideas. I had never heard that before. In DC, everybody told me I was crazy. So I was obsessed for my first touchdown in Silicon Valley. So I came back, I sold my house, my car, everything I own. I moved across the country and I said I was gonna figure it out. And that's where I am now. I'm in the California and Oakland, um, still figuring it out one day at a time. Wow, Kai, that is so impressive. I just, I love, I love your story. And I was listening to a video of you speaking the other night and you shared a quote that said, until the lion learns how to write, every story will glorify the hunter. You shared that. And I thought that was really fascinating. And so it's like, you are championing the lions of the future and you know showing them what's possible out there. And so that the stories can be about them, not about the hunters. That's how yeah. I, cool. Thank you so much for that. Thank Amazing. Um, wonderful. Okay, so Samir, what about you? You've got a really fascinating background um, as well and really curious um, how that's showing up for you right now and what that journey has been like. One of the common themes tonight seems to be matriculating outside of the classroom. And Kai, thank you so much for articulating my philosophy on homework optimization, especially because my parents are on this call here tonight and I've never really had the words to tell them that a 90% was, was enough. Um, but regardless, in pulling that thread, um, I am where I am, uh, much like everyone on this call, I'm sure, um, because of my parents, uh, both uh, directly and indirectly. Indirectly, I am the person I am today because um, my parents were born um, in East Africa. My mother was born in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and she had to be a mother of um, four siblings at four other siblings at the age of 12. My father forcefully was um, forced out of the country in Uganda uh, during the Idi Amin regime, which we all likely know um, aspects about. Um, and so the point is very simple. The developing world and stories of home have always been in our household. And it's always been in my blood to return to those communities and to do, to make the biggest impact that I could make. And, you know, I'm a proud um, participant in the Duke UNICEF Innovation Accelerator, but one could argue that I've been in an entrepreneurship accelerator my entire childhood. Um, I've been in such an incubator because in our household, we didn't have Charles Dickens lying around. We had Muhammad Yunus's banker to the poor, you know, on our coffee table. 
And um, we didn't get an allowance either. Uh, we got Kiva microcredit accounts, you know, that we could disp disperse $25 loans to someone in Venezuela, uh, for example. So this is my background. And one could say that I became an entrepreneur because of momentum. Um, I would like to say, um, and I think we should all, um, I would like to say, I am an entrepreneur because it is the most fun. It's the most fun thing I could possibly be doing. And I would also like to make an impact at scale. So those two things combined uh, make me who I am. That's um, beautiful. I love, um, I certainly relate to the parents or sort of unsung heroes for a lot of us. And I know speaking personally, um, I had the immense good fortune of having parents who are always like, you can do whatever you want. And we're willing to sort of back me up on that. And I know that there, that's an incredible privilege, but um, yeah, just really wonderful to have you share that. And um, just all of those snippets of those childhood memories and how that imprint um, has brought you to who you are today. Thank you for that, it's beautiful. All right, Kai, Scott, what about you, friend? Absolutely, again, like everyone else said, I'm so excited to be here and thank you for having me. Uh, and when I think about my own personal story or towards or to becoming a social entrepreneur, the one thing that kind of jumps out as a, a light motif uh, throughout my life is um, being true to myself. And so when I think about uh, you know myself as a social scientist, you think of that as a fairly adult like undertaking, you know, something you go to school for and learn about. I actually was doing it from the very beginning. Um, when I was a small child, I think I'm going to say 12, but I can't remember the age, actually, uh, I would go around and survey people about what's going on in their lives. Are you happy? What's going, you know, uh, what do you do? What's your favorite this, what, you know, whatnot. So I, I, always from a very early age, I've been curious and asking questions and, you know, gathering data, you know, even those small sets uh, to begin with. And so, you know, or I was entering things into a computer that wasn't functioning, right? So I, I was kind of priming myself and naturally gravitating towards things um, and really practicing for what I would eventually do, which is what I do now and I really enjoy. And it's kind of lending the skills and the tools and the, the curiosity that I have to kind of some of the pressing issues, especially around gender diversity. But even before that, I used to work in the mining industry, uh, looking at social impacts of mining on communities, uh, particularly within northern parts of Canada. Uh, particularly working with Indigenous communities, which is always such a huge honor to be a part of that. And so, uh, you know, kind of the, the social science piece came at a very early age, came very naturally, and then I've shaped that into different um, pathways. Uh, also related to what I do now um, at TransFocus is being, in terms of being true to myself, is that I had to figure out my gender, which was a very uh, uneven path since that's the theme of this talk. Uh, and it took me a while to, to figure that out on a personal level. And it was really interesting that once I kind of pieced all the puzzles uh, pieces together uh, and that I understand myself to be a trans man, uh, that, that unlocked all these things that were kind of tampered down, uh, both in terms of my energy level, in terms of vision, insight, being able to connect with others, the long list, right? And so as soon as that happened, I, you know, in a bit of navel gazing that goes along with transition, <laughs> then I was able to be like, hey, wh what do we got to do? There's some issues that I've kind of encountered. How do we solve those? I see that others have tried. Um, you know, there's a long list of, of trans, non-binary, and two-spirit elders that precede me that have done really valuable work, but it's just, it's landed flat. Um, and a lot of it is maybe not others being ready to hear what they have to share. And so I get to now take it to the next level. Uh, and it's just such a, um, I, I feel so fortunate, so humbled and so honored to, to be a part of that change um, along with others who are doing the same, right? So, um, so true to myself is kind of my key thing that's been there all the way along. I love that. That's so rich. I um, I love that you were doing stuff when you were a kid too. It reminds me a lot of what Samir was saying. And in fact, everybody has mentioned to some extent, like those 
early experiences. And I know that was really true for me too, um, that I knew from a very young age that I wasn't going to fit in to the sort of what I perceived as the mainstream kind of corporate working world. And, um, and in fact, one of my ventures, uh, G-Day was founded based on kind of a dream that I had as an adolescent and, um, yeah, so it's it's really incredible. And then that process, in a way, I think, you know, there's a false perception that we we grow up, right? We grow out of those childhood things, whereas in fact, there's such great truth in them. And in many ways, I think it's a pretty good idea to kind of go back. And in fact, it's something I recommend in the book is um, kind of a, a childhood regression meditation to sort of get really curious about the things that you were curious about when you were a kid, what did you love? You know, why did you love going up to people and asking them if they were happy? You know, what did those, you know, Kiva lending accounts mean to you? What did those, you know, stories from the immigrant parents mean? What, you know, those types of things, because I, I think that we sort of lose sight of that or we devalue that and actually it can point us towards our truest self. So um, thank you all for, for raising all of that. Um, I am going to, and also I wanted to say, and I love that you're doing it anyways, just if panelists want to build off what other panelists are saying or whatever, there's something in there, like go for it. Um, um, yeah, so, okay. So I now I want to talk about, um, and some of you got pretty close to it, but the sort of aha moments, like what are those moments where it just tipped, like it was just something that had to change and you knew that it was you who had to do it. Like, I know I've had the experience of, I have an idea and I'll, I'll spend a lot of time telling other people they should do it. And then I notice after like the 17th time I've told somebody that they should do this brilliant idea. I'm like, oh, <laughs> maybe that's me. Um, anyways, it, I've, I've founded four ventures now at this point or co-founded and what they all have in common is a very clear vision of impact of that it's kind of an emotional, it's partly creative for me, everybody experiences it a little bit differently, but I'd love to hear um, just, and maybe it wasn't one moment, like I know I've had ventures that have taken many, 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 many years um, to evolve, but like what flipped the switch from like you're being on the path of doing this thing to like you see an opportunity and, and it's you and you know it's time. So um, let's start with you, Alana, or what I guess Taylor called it the moment of obligation or aha moment that brought you to where your work currently is. Um, well, I, it actually ties in really well with what you were discussing. So this idea of going back to your child uh, hood. So I would say I, I had it like, I'll, I'll narrow it down to two, maybe three aha moments, but they'll, they'll be on the path. Um, but it's this idea that um, we value play like as children from the moment we're born to like the summer before grade one, we understand that play is how we learn, how we understand the world, how we experience everything. And then something happens when you get into grade one where it's like, oh, play is no longer how we learn or how we communicate or how we exist in the world. It's not, it's not um, serious work. Serious work is homework. Serious work is memorizations and tests and play is recess. It's not, no longer not only work, it's now the opposite of work. And we don't really get back to that. And so I think um, my call to action really came with this idea that we stop playing the summer, like right after kindergarten, start stop valuing those skills like empathy and failure and all those social emotional skills, even the skills that we call soft, um, as opposed to the hard skills. Um, but even when we go into the adult world, we're being told the importance of hard skills, but um, the World Economic Forum had a future of jobs report in 2016, and it was for this uh, 2020 actually, uh, where it said creativity, social and emotional learning, they talk about empathy specifically being the key skills for the future. And now we're asking adults to be creative, collaborative, innovative disruptors, but we stopped playing. We stopped valuing all the skills that we know get you there. There's a study from NASA that shows that um, fourth grade, like uh, kindergarten students, 98% are considered creative geniuses. By the time that they're the age of 25, less than 2%. Something is happening in those 21 years and we know what's happening. It's being educated out of them. And this idea that we know a four or five, six year old's favorite word is why, and they ask why, and then you get into school and you start, your favorite word is now like, uh, what is it? Um, which, which, but I forgot how I spelled it, but it's, will it be on the test? <laughs> That's the new, you know, we stop, um, we start like 
playing and we start counting. Marks are, are really that important. And I think my two aha moments or uh, yeah, my aha moments around that would the first one would be when I designed the Empathy Twin School. Uh, it's an abstract three-dimensional puzzle that you play blindfolded. One person is given a built pattern, one, one of like a thousand different combinations. And you have to describe this abstract 3D puzzle to one or more people so they can recreate it. And in the span of 15 minutes, you gain huge insights into how you navigate patience, frustration, and most importantly, creative communication. So whether you're six or a CEO, whether you're two people or 200, the game acts as a metaphor for a real life scenario. So you can actually start to unpack and discuss these kind of stickier conversations. And my aha moment was when I had um, Emily, who is eight years old, who was testing it out during the day and she played it with her best friend who was sighted. And they had a moment where Emily was grabbed one of these, they're behind me if you can see them over there. Um, but these kind of like pieces that I designed to have no name. And she's putting her hands around it. She goes, the flower piece. And there's this moment that Emily said like, it's not a flower, but okay. And they had this like negotiation about language. And then they started discussing what they would call things that don't have names. And they created a common language and a shared language. And then I saw exactly the same thing happen with the adults who then played the game later that day. And the negotiations and like something so simple has created such a ripple effect. And so the aha moment that I had from that um, is uh, when I decided to start 21 Toys, and my joke is I, my series of escalating dares were that the empty toy won this award and I was encouraged as a designer to find a business person to sell it to, because that's what you do. Um, and I'm so lucky nobody wants to start an empathy company. <laughs> no one's like, yeah, I want to start a company that's selling empathy toys to schools. No one wants to sign up for that. So luckily, because I couldn't find that, I created that. And I didn't know what a social entrepreneurship was. I didn't have any of that understanding of, can you build a business that's for profit that's pos like that's um, creating positive change? Like, what does that even mean? And when I started unpacking just this idea of toys, my biggest aha moment to know that there was something here that I could create a seriously substantial, like a substantial change both in schools as well as in large organizations is discovering the inventor of kindergarten, whose name is Friedrich Froebel. He's this 19th century philosopher. Every architecture student knows about Froebel because he invented a series of toys that he called gifts that later became kindergarten. And these were abstract, very like, yeah, just these gorgeous pieces of art and every single creative genius of like the past 20th and 20 or the 20th century, 21st century, like uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, Bunk Buckminster Fuller, who invented the geodesic dome, the grandfather of industrial design, Kandinsky, the Bauhaus movement, Montessori schools, they are all Froebel educated and they talk about them in their biography so that these abstract, simple, and you could possibly dismiss them as unimportant they are foundational to the way that they saw the world and they are foundational to how they built that new world. So I always like to say that we're kind of picking up where he left off. He, he invented 20. So it's called 21 toys because we're picking up where he left off. If he were alive today, what skills would he be designing for? So I think that was the inspiration and the aha moment that said, this is, this is a cause that I really think I, I personally create a dent in and the empathy toy was the first in a series of toys. So I've invented a toy that teaches failure. Next one is improv. Uh, and I have an entire suite of toys that um, I'm just, yeah, excited to invent and then put into the hands of teachers and coaches and facilitators who frankly are creative geniuses. They just haven't had the chance to play in, in a really long time. Wow, I, it's amazing. <laughs> I've known you for six years now and I, I just learned a whole bunch more. Uh, uh, stuff about what you do and how you think and, and why. And I, I just find it so incredibly sad, especially as a parent that we don't like this notion of play is, is devalued, as you say, after, you know, it's time to get serious and do homework and that's how you actually learn. And, and I really hope that we're, and it's thanks to people like you that we're unlearning that and rethinking that and I, I am only successful because there are incredible educators and systems and organizations and individuals who are already doing the work. I'm just designing a tool that gets them there faster. And so the exciting thing is there are so many that are tackling this. We're in kindergartens and high schools. We're also in MBA programs. 
we're in colleges and universities and we're in organizations and I'm seeing change throughout from how schools are valuing more portfolio-based experience-based work and companies are asking more for that. And so there's a lot of change happening that's exciting. And I think for us, it's, I think we met the moment where there's, how do we teach that? And for me, it's like, well, we can't use the same tools. Let's like, we can't, uh, yeah. It's a spreadsheet is not gonna solve this and a slide deck is not gonna solve this. So uh, the toys are such an important tool uh, that help those that are already doing that work uh, get there faster and frankly, just in a more fun way, more creative way. Awesome. That's amazing. Uh, thank you. That's incredible. Um, okay. Okay. Where are we? We are going back to Kai Frazier and we're talking about moments of obligation. And this, again, you, you know, we've already heard several moments about your, your childhood and not being able to access these things, um, experiencing homelessness, like, wow, was there one moment or a series of moments that led you into the VR, the insight that this was a way to inspire children to dream bigger for themselves, to be the hunters, or to be, to be the lions um, telling the stories instead of the hunters? Yeah, I was thinking about it. Um, I think when I was uh, teaching, it was my, I remember my, I thought I was gonna be a forever teacher. And I remember I got about a couple years in and I was like, oh my God, help is not coming for us. <laughs> like, like we are struggling in these classrooms. We don't have computers. We're down to bring your own devices. You know, we, we think about like, if I remember growing up, I had a computer lab. When we went to laptops, there were no more computer labs. So we had to move, we had to have laptops on the carts and we had to push them classroom to classroom and sign up for them. And when the laptops came to us, we had to hope that they were charged, that all the buttons were there, they were all working. So like, we just didn't have tech. So it got down to bring your own device. Do you have a smartphone? Well, whip that out and we're just gonna use that. And this is in, in, in a time where it's like cell phones are taboo. So it's like, don't bring it. You're gonna get in trouble if you have your cell phone. It's like, literally, this is all we have to connect us. So there was a moment I got one year and I was just like, help isn't coming. And I remember I just quit. I had no plan. And I was like, I just, I can't, my hands were tied. I can't do this. I'm watching kids graduate and they're going on and, and they are struggling. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to museums. I'm going to figure this out. And I, cause, cause my big thing was it, it's not rocket scientists. If you had a kid that was struggling and you show them something different, like their whole mind changed. So you show them a career, you show them a new opportunity. They're like, wow, my life doesn't have to be like this. And then once they've been exposed, they can never go back. So for me, it was like, how do I get them 20 minutes up the street? So I'm like, I'm going to go 20 minutes up the street to DC. And I got to DC and I'm like, I have, I know the answer. And I got there and I was like, oh, this is government. <laughs> I was like, oh, nobody cares. Oh, we're going to keep doing stuff and be 10 years behind life and nobody cares. And it, and it was like, it was my, I felt like I was going crazy. And every time I would say, well, statistically one, uh, you know, I think it's the stat is like one for every three kids, three black kids, um, one of them is doing their homework on a smartphone. Um, so it's like most of them do, like they don't have computers. They have to do like, so a third, 30% of black kids have to do their homework in their world on a smartphone. So if we know this, why are we only building tools that work on ex expensive tech or laptops? It's basically white supremacy. It's like these kids, like it's statistically showing you they don't have it. So I was in museums like, well, duh, this is not, so ended up leaving museum. I was always in trouble with museums because I would ask the questions like, have we ever thought about doing it like this? And it was like, you need to go see a director, you're on a performance improvement plan. I mean, I was always in trouble for little stuff. Um, and I was like, okay, well, this isn't it. So I, I felt like I was a failure when it came to like holding these jobs down once I got into corporate. And then I got to Silicon Valley and I'm, and I'm walking around and I'm like, and I'm in conferences and they're like, oh, this educational tool uses so-and-so, yada, 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 and it will transform education. And I would just say something like, you know all schools don't have Wi-Fi, right? And they're like, what are you talking about? So I felt, so I had spent my whole career feeling so much, um, everybody made me feel like I was not smart ever. And really I was being a phenomenal multitasker. Like for example, oh, I don't have a computer. I don't have internet. How can I do homework if I don't have a book? I owe 
I owe a library fine. So they won't give me a book. I don't have a textbook because I owe $10 from last year because I had a library fine. So I, or I owe $10 in school lunch. And I couldn't afford the lunch. So they won't give me a book. So it's like, how do I do my work without having a book? So I always had to think about other ways through things. And I was always, people made me feel like I was really dumb because I had to, do, I, I thought like that. And I realized that having, being not in the click of, of, you know, having all of these great things that it gave me, I always say Silicon Valley has billion dollar blind spots. Cause I'll, I'll go to a room and I'm just like, what do you mean? Like, that's not how the world lives. Um, it's, it's something as simple as, um, I don't know if you've ever seen, they call it like the racist like soap dispenser. Like if you try to wash your hands in some sinks, um, like if I try to wash my hands because my skin is darker, the sensor won't uh, come on. So the water won't come on. And it, and it happens, I see it all the time. Like I, there was an exhibition in a museum in LA and they had rain coming from the ceiling. Um, and the day I went to visit it, it was Prince that just died. So it was purple rain, they made it purple. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to go in here. And the, the thing was you could walk in the rain and you wouldn't get wet. And I was like, I can't wait, purple rain, it's gonna be great. And I walked in there and I got drenched. And I was like, why am I, like, what? Like, I I didn't come for this. And it's one of the security guards pointing to the side was like, no, it, it don't work for you, it's not gonna work for you. And I had, so it's like these billion dollar blinds that happen every single day. So my aha moment was, I didn't have to be, super smart. I didn't have to have a top college degree. I just had to like ask a question and be committed to answering it no matter how simple it was. Because if there's one of me, there's two of me and then there's more and those are the people that we're not innovating for. So it's gonna take people who are on the outskirts who have been treated like this to come up and say like, my ideas, my thoughts are valid. Um, and if I can just get support to take that idea to the next level, then you know I can do amazing things. So my company is mobile first that shows kids across the world diverse experiences that so you can put on, you can go on your smartphone or put in a VR headset and see uh, aerospace engineering as a VR field trip. It's a black girl named Tiana who works for NASA and she's uh, making a, 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 a space launch system for the next mission to Mars from NASA. So at an early age, you can see a black girl in Atlanta being an aerospace engineer. What does that do for you if you grew up like me? You know, so how can I make that mobile first? We can all see it. And then the kids are going to have the solution. I always tell folks, I'm not, I don't have the solution. I'm just answering the questions as a teacher. And then they're the ones that are going to make the next stories, make the next things. But somebody has to give them the pathway and help them see things. So they have the confidence to come and innovate. So I'm just a middle person. I'm just a middle man for all of these things, a middle woman, if you will. Um, and I'm really, what keeps me motivated is knowing that they have the answers. The kids coming behind me and I'm so excited with all of these tools we're talking about with the toys all these things that change how they're thinking that's our role um and i'm happy to play that role and that's my aha moment those are my series of aha moments <laughs> wow i love every single thing about this i love your attitude and your energy and just really validating yourself for taking those insights gleaned from a very real, very challenging existence and bringing them to expose those blind spots. And, and this is something I talk about a lot in the book, how um, I call it gifts from the fringe, how the things that has been the other, has been the outside, has been the non-traditional are exactly the insights and the people and the leaders who we need now because we haven't seen them, because you have not been included, because you're, you, know, you were not there, you were not in those rooms, you were not welcome, you were not perceived as being you know, educated enough or looking the right way or whatever. And um, it, that just every single thing that you say speaks so strongly to exactly why I wrote the book and why this isn't about getting integrated, um, integrating diverse people into the mainstream. This is about centering and foregrounding those ideas as being the best source of innovation in the world today. So thanks for that. And you're just amazing. I could listen to you all day. Um, amazing. Um, and I love your rebellious kind of spirit of just keep asking those questions and don't be afraid because you have a right to be there and you have a right to know. And that's, that's pointing the way to the future. Um, so thank you, Kai. That's amazing. Wow. Okay. I don't know about anybody else, but my heart rate is up um, listening to all of this. And um, Samir, what can you share with us? Um, 
about any aha moment. I know, um, anyways, I've watched your TED talk, so I know a little bit, but maybe there are some others or things that people don't already know. So I'll just be quiet and listen to you. Well, thank you guys for your, your input already. I'm learning so much. Um, uh, so thank you so much. Um, you know, I love how panels and webinars can, um, can, uh, can build and, and find their own themes in the ether. And I think one of the themes tonight is, um, is about childhood and uh, a child's curiosity and play and, and those fun things. And to pull from another example from my childhood, you know, one of the things that our, our family used to do um, was to annually watch the CNN Heroes Tribute. Maybe you guys know that show. They basically take 10 everyday people and highlight and spotlight their, their nonprofit initiatives. Um, and I remember watching one in particular when I was, I don't know, like eight or 10, um, about an, a man named Derek Kayungo, who was a, a Ugandan refugee. And he moved to the US and he started this hotel soap recycling organization. Um, and I just thought it was absolutely incredible that a single person could make such a massive impact. Um, and I define massive as being able to reach so many different people and yeah, you know, make so many bars of soap for people in need. Um, but you know what, when I was eight or 10, I kind of locked that memory away. You know, it was hidden in my subconscious. And then I would say 11 years later or so, um, I was traveling through rural Cambodia, Northern Cambodia, amazing country, I love that country. Um, and I witnessed something that I would never forget. Um, I saw in a, in a rural village, uh, a village woman, uh, a mother bathing her newborn child there. But unfortunately, she was scrubbing his skin with laundry detergent, um, a very caustic and toxic alternative to bar soap, that something that we would all probably take for granted. And in that moment, I felt a, a very uh, significant um, level of discouragement and pain. And I just did not know how I could participate in this problem and get involved. And then I returned to my relatively luxurious hotel room later that night. And I walked into the hotel bathroom and I noticed that my housekeeper had thrown away a bar of soap that I had barely even touched. And suddenly that subconscious memory just unlocked again. And you know, Madeline, um, I remember you saying you imagine yourself being an artist when you grew up and there's a saying that good artists steal, right? Um, and I think the same can apply to social entrepreneurs as long as it's not IP, of course. Um, but a good model was to find a wasted resource and then connect it with a need immediately. And so basically Eco Soap Bank was founded in a hotel bathroom uh, of all places. And what we do is we employ 160 women in Africa and Asia to recycle leftover soap, which is then redistributed to vulnerable people in need to reduce disease and save lives. Very happy to say that we've reached over 6 million people uh, with soap and hygiene education. But the thing is this, um, we have iterated on that previous model. We've brought women into the fold and economic opportunities for them and their families. We have decentralized manufacturing and redistribution of soap to people in need right in those countries and those regions. So progress doesn't stop. And I guess the takeaway is if you see a good idea there's always room for growth and innovation to take it to the next level. I could not agree more and, and thank you for that. And thanks for, yeah, I'd, um, I was, I had heard the Cambodia story and that's just so um, heartbreaking and touching and to know that you built that idea into something, you know, that has made, is impacting so many people. And then that it's even more, it's got this employment for women aspect and, and, and building on it. And I, I see that very strongly in the menstrual health and equity field where I do most of my work and where most of my background is, you know, when I started out, there was something nobody wanted to talk about. Oh my goodness. And, um, but 
it's gone on to gain currency and now there's all manner, you know, now I get to hang out with those good people at the Duke UNICEF social innovation <laughs> accelerator. Um, but I just love that. And thank you. Like this, it's amazing how these simple insights of taking something that is, is would otherwise be garbage and identifying the need and, you know, spinning it in a very different way. Uh, and, with an impact model at its heart is it's a brilliant solution and congratulations I just I think this is absolutely like you know when you, you spell it out like that it's like oh of course and yet nobody else well this gentleman had to an extent done it um but anyways I just love things like that I love when it's just a win on so many levels and to me that exemplifies the genius of social entrepreneurs so thank you so much for sharing that um Okay, I'm seeing that we've got nine minutes left. Kai Scott, over to you. And what? let's hear about your aha moments with TransFocus. Yeah, and this is fantastic listening to everybody else's stories, very powerful insights. And for me, uh, the aha moment actually came through, so, and, and I actually talk about this and it's in the book, uh, through a, a volunteer opportunity. Uh, I'm someone who uh, can be very hesitant to start something new if I don't know the full landscape and, you know, I, I feel like I have to figure it all out before contributing something. Um, and uh, I was asked to be a part of a task force with the Vancouver Park Board here uh, in British Columbia in Canada. And we, it was about a one-year effort that we put together uh, to make recreation more inclusive of transgender, non-binary, and two-spirit folks. And, you know, as a social scientist, I could kind of develop the multi-stakeholder consultation processes and, you know, did, we did surveys and interviews. I mean, I kind of geeked out <laughs> heavily on that uh, endeavor and it was a lot of fun. And at the end, we had 77 recommendations, all of which were adopted from a board that was actually very mixed in its political orientation. So that was very impressive. And it was just like a real boost to the community and very exciting for us to be a part of that. Now, what happened is that we then got a lot of requests for, from other municipalities, from other organizations. We got a deluge of, of response um, because there was some media on it. We went to uh, conferences and basically, you know, very quickly we got to see that there's a demand or a huge need for this knowledge and not just what to do culturally, like have come in and do some education, but actually structurally, what to change about washrooms, what to do about forms. There's just so much involved in, uh, I like what Kai was saying in your story, it resonated very strongly. The world isn't created uh, for certain kinds of people. And so, uh, you know, it just requires, you, creating your own thing or working with what the existing structure to try to kind of give it some um, give some ease and whatnot for folks. And so one day, um, another a task force member and I, we, we were sitting uh, on our couch having a discussion, they were shifting their career and, you know, wondering if they should do some sort of foundation. And I was like, look, that's going to take a lot of time what if we just started a consulting agency? We could start tomorrow, essentially. You just, you know, put a name up, you know, there's a few things, wells and whistles, but essentially you can start advising right away. And that just sparked that moment where we, you know, did a few kind of a um, little bit of market research and whatnot, but we essentially started a few months later with our practice and it's been going six years strong since then. Um, but it was really the volunteer. And I think that's super important because oftentimes um, there's a lot of pressure when you're a social entrepreneur to have it kind of figured out, or um, it's very difficult to figure out what to do because there's no strong templates, uh, or at least until this book there wasn't and um anywho i i just uh volunteers is a very great way to go uh to figure out if that's something for you super cool kai i um i actually call it lifestyle tourism sometimes of like how can you try on being this thing without being it or just be in it and have conversations and learn and and um like try it on just like how does this feel and and see what happens and I also want to just do a shout out for TransFocus because I guess we worked with you I want to say about five years ago and um not long after we had started to you know really take the the conversation in the menstrual space which is so traditionally 
femme coded um, where people in their minds, it's like, well, if someone uses menstrual products, they must be a woman or a girl. And it's, and it's like this absolutely biologically essentialist, like no getting around it in so many ways. And, but also an opportunity to really change people's perception. And so much great work has been done um, by leaders like yourself and by folks in the menstrual health space to really go, no, actually not everyone who menstruates is a woman. And, you know, there's this whole other spectrum of gender and really transformed an entire industry to the point where like mainstream players are um, looking at gender in a completely different, far more inclusive way. So um, I felt really proud of that work and um, just having seen it firsthand, um, what you all have created is, is extraordinary. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, all right, so I know we're down to four minutes. I, I want to acknowledge that there's a question that's come in from um, or a comment from the audience that I want to share because somebody took a bit of time to write it down. And then I think I'm afraid we need to wrap up. I knew this was going to go like lightning. So um, the comment says, I have a daughter who will start junior kindergarten in Ontario in the fall of 2022. They want to put her in a self-contained or segregated classroom due to her disability autism. It strikes me that this is related to how all kindergartners, whether they have a disability or not, are creative geniuses and then lose it, as Alana is saying. Children like my daughter are kept apart because the system is too afraid to include them. And, you know, to me, that's a perfect way of kind of rounding us out because it seems that every single one of us has pointed to a system that isn't working, that is designed, you know, for a very specific group of people. And yet, if we actually want that system to work for everybody, it needs to be inclusive, it needs to be kind, and that is the true genius that's going to improve it for everybody. So I'm sorry to hear this about your daughter being treated this way, and I hope that folks are able to actually learn to see her as a creative genius and design a better educational system for her, and thank you so much for sharing that um, amazing insight. So. I don't know who I'm passing this back to. Am I passing back to Matt or maybe Taylor or Madison? I can't, I don't have to run a show in front of me anymore. Or I could just keep going. I'm good with that. Um, I could take it back. I could take it back. I mean, let me just say that it's just been such an inspiring conversation, gang. I mean, hearing about moments of obligation that um, may have seemed passing at the moment, you know, as you reflected on them, really moved action. You know, you're all such incredible change makers working on important areas of, you know, critical problems. And I especially appreciate the conversation around youth. You know, Ashoka, when they select their fellows, they often look for these patterns through life, you know, and they, uh, the, the, they whether there was a change making experience they had in childhood or a pattern of, of change making experiences. And each of you have kind of reflected on those in your own way through such inspiring stories and the great work that you're doing. I, I certainly hope that um, not only the audience that joined us here today, but, but those who'll be watching uh, the recordings here in the in the days and weeks ahead, we'll, we'll take a moment to uh, look into your work, to follow you on social media, to look into your, your websites and um, uh, find ways to engage and hopefully take the inspiration that I know that, that I've taken from it and, and find ways to plant those seeds in our own work. So really appreciate your time here this evening, everybody. Uh, Madeline, you've assembled such an amazing group. Thank you so much for the wonderful job you've done moderating tonight. My absolute pleasure, Matt. And thanks again to all of you so much for showing up. Um, super grateful to all of you and just like amazing work. Don't stop. Um, and let's do this again sometime. Absolutely. Thank you so much, all. Have a okay. great evening. Thanks, Matt.